explains stuff. She sees his dick. He, <laughs> she's like, oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> Which makes me, you know, feel a type of way that Anthony is hung. Yeah. Or she's never seen a dick before. Okay, fine. <laughs> Shut up, man. Do you have to kill it? another episode of romancing the monsters i'm m hi i'm s i'm seth and this week we read the viscount who loved me by julia quinn i don't know what should i say anything else i mean like we could say it's anthony's story so from bridgerton if you're just watching the tv show it's the eldest bridgerton story yes so seth what is this book about beyond just anthony and kate uh well, I mean... Well, I mean, maybe not beyond that, because it's pretty much the whole <laughs> plot, but... Um, okay, so we start the book off by meeting Kate and her sister Edwina, and um, they're reading Lady Whistledown's newest edition, um, you know, as everyone does in the ton, um, and it focuses on Viscount Bridgerton and his rakish ways, and uh, Kate's firmly in the, I'm not going to get married this season, or if ever I'm never gonna get married so she's more like looking for a husband for her younger sister who was the season's incomparable she's like the diamond of the season um and she (laughs) tells her sister you are not marrying Anthony Bridgerton that is never gonna happen because he's a rake and he's a rogue and that's never gonna happen cut to um a ball and um Mr. Colin Bridgerton matchmaker extraordinaire (laughs) I love Colin in this book I Um, love him um, Kate, she sees Anthony and her sister Edwina dancing and like she's fuming mad and then Colin comes and he like starts talking to her and like he, like, she's just not mincing words. She's Kate, um, unapologetically unapolo- Kate. Um, and then Anthony decides to, uh, talk to his brother Colin and Colin's like, you know what, bro, you gotta meet Kate. Um, <laughs> I mean, he's like, she's so kind. She can't stop talking about you. Yeah. I mean, she's going to love you. <laughs> yeah. And at this point, everyone in the ton knows that they have to go through Kate in order to win her approval to court Edwina. Um, and so Anthony's like, all right. Oh, and I forgot to mention, Anthony decided this was the year that he was going to get married because he needs an heir. Um, because he is the eldest son, and he's like, any woman would do. I'll go for the the most beautiful one, which is the season's incomparable, which is Edwina. Well, uh, I mean, hold on a minute. He says she's got to be beautiful because, like, you know, makes things easier for him. Sure. Uh, then he's like, she's got to be intelligent because he doesn't want asshole. a half-wit who's going to, really you know. <laughs> produce stupid children. Yeah, and then he's like, she has to be a woman who I cannot, under any circumstances, fall in love with. with. Because. Oh, because. Oh, so. Okay, the prologue, I kind of skipped it. But. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we got Which a flashback. Which is kind of huge. <laughs> <laughs> we got a flashback with, um, you know, the dad. The Bridgerton dad. Um, Edmund. Yeah. Edmund? Yeah. Yes. Um, and Such we, a good we got dad. to see how amazing he was as a father and, like, how loving he was and caring for his children. Um, sadly, he passed away by a bee sting. And back then, they didn't really know um, allergies to bees were a thing. Um, and he was only 38 or 39 at that point, and he died. And a lot of people just didn't understand how that happened. Um, so Anthony had vowed that he would never fall in love um, because it would just be harder to leave because he believes that he would die at the same age as his father or but he could then. never surpass his father in yeah. any way shape or form including yeah. the number of years that his father has lived exactly 
Um, and so, yeah, he just didn't want to leave someone who loves him. And also, he doesn't, it just, it'd be hard to leave someone that did. And someone because he, he saw loved. what it did to his mom. Exactly. Yeah. Um, anyways, so he decided that this was the year and he decided on Edwina because he didn't ever see him possibly ever falling in love with her. Um, anyways, it starts off at the ball and we finally get to see Kate and Anthony and their <laughs> amazing bickering nature. Uh, Mm -hmm. and the story just goes from there and we see them get closer, but also continue to quote unquote, hate each other. Um, she gets compromised because this man decides to, uh, suck Suck on her titties. Yeah, there you go. (laughs) Um, and they have to get married and it kind of sucks because this is a woman that he saw himself falling in love with. So he's kind of doing what he said he wasn't going to do. Um, so... What did you think of this book? First off, this is my third time reading it. It's <laughs> Seth's second time reading it. Yes. And it's Seth's first time first reading time. it. So you got three perspectives here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> ladies and gents. Uh, so let's start with S. Okay, so. Marge is like hiding under her cover right now. I know. Um, no, I'm not. I don't know. This was a hard book to rate. And I think it's mainly because it was hard to get into in the beginning. Yeah. And I mentioned, I mentioned to you girls that it was, the audiobook was, I don't know, it just, it, it felt weird and I felt disconnected from the story. Hmm. Okay. I didn't really like Anthony. Hmm. Like it, it took me a- He's, he me, is an asshole. He yeah. Is. It, it took me to a long said. time to kind of like warm up to him. Um, I loved Kate. Mm-hmm. I really freaking loved her. She was great. And then there were some issues throughout the story that were just kind of annoying. We'll get into those later on. Because it's kind of, it's it's throughout the story. So I want to say that maybe I started to really, really enjoy it up until like maybe the 70%. That is so strange because for me, and I'm sorry, I'm skipping over you, Seth. <laughs> when are you <laughs> She's not? She's rolling her eyes. What do you mean, when do you not? <laughs> Excuse me. What does okay, that go. Mean, You're cutting into um, my time here. It's It's really weird because for me, it's, it's actually the opposite. Like, I find this book extremely easy to fall into. Like, the the banter from page one is just so great. Like, Kate with her family. Um, you know, the prologue is really engaging. Kate with Antony, obviously, and, like, their whole thing. And for me, the book starts um, losing some of its, I don't know, like, fire, I guess you could say, um, at, like, 65%. Like, after they get married. That, that for me is always, there's always a part from 65 to 85 or so where I'm like less, like enjoying it less mm-hmm. because I feel like the banter is not as present between them because obviously like they kind of caught feelings by that point. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so they're not being as bantery with each other, but bantery is not a word, I'm pretty sure, but whatever. Um, we make it so, a word here. Yeah. So, so anyway, interesting. Okay. I like it. I, I like that we... We got different perspectives. Did you like it overall again the third time reading it? Oh, yeah. I mean, mm. I I just, I forget every time just how great their banter is. Mm. Like, I just, I really think, like, this book is not perfect by any stretch of the imagination, mm. but I really do think that the strength of it is in the banter. Like, exactly. I just, yeah. I, for me anyway, the characters really do come alive in those scenes together. Yeah. And, the thing is, the second time I read it, I, I did the audiobook like S did, and I felt that sort of, like, like that same sort of detachment from what was going on from the audiobook. Mm-hmm. Um, I remember you said S that it was like more uh, Tal than show, mm-hmm. and I, I felt that way when I did the audiobook, but I didn't feel that way when I read it. So I don't know, something to keep in mind. Maybe it's just not a great audiobook. Oh, sorry, I wonder if it's like you said that, you know, because the banter is like the heart of the story, was she executing it as well as you read it or like as well as you imagine it? Uh, Rosalind Lendor is really good with the banter. Okay. And like Julia Quinn has banter in all her books. Like she she's known for it. So like she knows that. Yeah, okay. okay. <laughs> um, so I don't know. But I, 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 just, I find it interesting that like both S and I have that feeling. Yeah. With the audiobook. Yeah. Uh, yeah. What about you, Seth? Well, what I did didn't think I didn't try the audiobook um, at all. <laughs> I was just like, let me just go into my book. Um, 
And I kind of had a real struggle getting into the book. And really? I think it was, yeah, I I remembered clearly. It was like 22% and I was at 22% um, since Wednesday. And I was kind of going to message you girls and be like, I don't think I'll finish it by Friday. Um, <laughs> and then it kind of got uh, really like, I don't even know, by like, I guess after the 22, like so once I picked it up again, I got really into it again. And like, I really liked the story and I liked Anthony and Kate and like, my rating still stayed the same. I think it was at a 3.5 on Goodreads. And I think I just rounded it up to a four star. Um, and anyways, I I enjoyed it. I thought it was a, overall a very good story with good characters. And like we talked about before, good banter. Um, Anthony's character, yes, <laughs> he was such an asshole. But like, I just... I like the realism because, his, I don't know, his mentality kind of matched that time period. And, like, he kind of, like, the reason why he was an asshole was because of his own, like, thought process. And it wasn't, like, anything else. Um, I don't know how to explain it. But Kate just stole the show. And Newton. Newton stole the show. He needs, we need a Newton in the in the show. Absolutely. If he's not there, we riot. Yeah. No, Newton had my heart. I mean, Anthony is, like... He's an asshole, sure. But sometimes it's like he does sweet, soft things yeah. and he surprises himself even. Yeah. Like, he will, like, reach out and, like, touch her hair and be like, I don't know why I just did that, but I felt like it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, it's mm-hmm. kind of like he's sort of realizing another side of himself. Because he's you never know? let himself act that way towards yeah. the opposite sex. He's I never let himself get that close. So I have a, I have a question. Yeah. So, like, how you mentioned that Anthony has never gotten close to anyone. How is it in the first book with him and the singer? Uh, a one line. A one line thing, probably. Oh. He's, okay. It's absolutely not like it is in the show. They really took that one line and they were like, we're going with it. <laughs> we're, okay. like, weaving this whole story. Which actually is one of my questions, which I don't know if you guys want to get into it now or later on when we... Uh, well, it's a question about, like, how... it's. It's a question about, like, how do you think... Because, obviously, she's much more in, uh, present in this book, or not necessarily... Pre- I mean, she she is actually technically present, but you know what I mean? Like, it, it's still, like, a chapter or so. Maria, you're talking about the opera singer? Yeah, Sienna slash Maria, depending on the show or the book. So, essentially, my question is, how do you think they're going to tackle the whole Sienna slash Antony thing? in season two considering it was you know such a huge part of well not a huge part but such you know it was a part of Antony's story in season one and they you know ended the season with them sort of saying goodbye so do you think they're gonna bring it back for season two and how I kind of think she will because if I know Shonda Rhimes I know she likes the drama um so what I think is gonna happen I think literally how it plays out in the book where like you know Kate's going to the concert at their house and then we see Anthony like with this Maria opera singer girl and I think what's gonna happen I think they're gonna play in like the whole angst level like he's gonna see Sienna after like a year apart and like the audience is gonna expect him to like want to be with Sienna and like you know try to like explore that but then like obviously Kate kind of steals a show when she's under the table and I don't know. I just, (laughs) I think it'll be angsty in that sense where like people expect him to go after her and like he might have some hurt feelings or like just feel a type of way if he sees her again. Um, But I, I think she will be in it. I don't see her not being in it. I mean, I don't want to mind like what you described. No, I don't want her at all, but I think she will be in it. (laughs) I mean, I kind of want her to be there just for the drama because we all know that it's not going to go anywhere because it doesn't Mm -hmm. even go anywhere in this book. Like, Anthony is like, he tries, but he's like, I can't keep my mind off of Kate. (laughs) He smells Kate. Like, does he have some kind of like special power? Like, who smells people that much? Well, because she was under his desk. Well, but he's like, oh, I smell soap. I'm like, when I, I I don't think I smell soap when, like, (laughs) Sorry, I'm just like I just showered, so I'm like She's sniffing herself. I don't, I don't smell my soap either. Unless someone's wearing like a lot of perfume, you don't really smell them. Am I insane? Like, am I, do I have a bad nose? I don't know. Unless you're like really, really, really close. Unless you know, it's like Westcliff and Lillian, where like 
oh. he was really sniffing oh, yeah. her up. So maybe it's the same case. When you find your soulmate, you kind of keep, you know, you know the scent. The eroticism of scent. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds weird. Okay. Let's dive into the story. The first scene I want to talk about is the serpentine oh. scene. <laughs> because it is so funny um essentially it starts with anthony who pays a visit to the uh, the sheffield household wanting to see edwina who he thinks he's courting um but instead he sort of stumbles upon kate um god knows where mary is and all this (laughs) but he stumbles upon kate and oh my god by the way he brings with him three bouquets of flowers and he's like one for you one for mary one for edwina and kate has never received flowers in her life guys i know (laughs) and anyway edwina's not there because she's at the park um with burbrook is it nigel burbrook is it (laughs) Yes, <laughs> Nigel Burbrook, who I think they kind of changed his character in the in the show. In the show, they did. Yeah, he's much more evil in the show. Yeah. In the books, he was just like this half wit, funny yeah. guy that's just <laughs> desperate for a wife. <laughs> um. Anyway, so Edwina's not there, and then uh, Newton comes around, and you know, does what Newton does, which is essentially to bring about chaos and destruction. Yeah. And so Kate is like, I got to walk this dog. And um, Mary is like, ooh, an opportunity for matchmaking. So she's <laughs> like, she sends Anthony and Kate to the park together to walk Newton. And uh, all hell breaks loose. Pretty Literally. Much. It's, 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 yeah. it's amazing. Anthony ends up, well, actually, Edwina ends up in, you know, the Serpentine drenched in water Antony is like so fucking mad <laughs> that part annoyed me a little He's like i'm gonna kill you i could not stop laughing and like i'm pretty sure he would commit bloody murder if he could have at that point he would have wrung her neck yeah <laughs> it was so funny um and by her we mean Kate. is like i don't know what happened <laughs> anyway i love that scene so so much uh, okay for that scene you know when they're like running like anthony decides oh fuck it i'm gonna have to run after this damn dog i'm literally just picturing his like tail coat like just like flapping in the wind and like he's like running and like everyone's watching this viscount and everyone's like what the heck the scandal and like i just couldn't stop laughing i i don't know i think think because i have a visual of like who was playing them i kind of saw it more as like a movie in my head so like I couldn't stop laughing because I actually visualized what was happening with the same actors that was really fun actually of being able to picture faces as you're reading yes I also yeah. just love the moment when um, she sees Kate realizes that Antony's running after her dog and she's like well we're already causing a scene yeah so then she picks up her skirts and yeah, she's and like she picks up her fuck skirts. it i gotta run too and tell if anyone sees my ankles <laughs> comedy gold ladies and gents comedy gold yeah. then that scene needs to be in the in the show for sure oh please please i just i i mean we all need to see uh antony just drenched in water you know why not have a little uh darcy moment yeah no and we also need to see him lose it because i feel like he's so calm and collected in the show minus like the scenes with sienna that like it'll be such a change for people to see him so angry i'm seeing him brought down to such a humiliating low (laughs) by a dog and a woman by a dog it's a wonder he hasn't killed the dog, honestly. I'm surprised that he accepted for Newton to live with them. You're right? <laughs> I was kind ma- of shocked. Because they're married. <laughs> oh, another question I have actually is, um, how did you guys feel about the addition of the, like the gossipy inserts at the beginning of each chapter, like the Lady Whistledown inserts? Because, uh, you know, that's, that's not necessarily something that you see in every book. So I just wonder, how did you guys like it? Because sometimes it sort of foreshadows what's going to happen. Sometimes it's like more of just chit chat about like what's up in town or. Yeah. So, yeah. How do you, how do you guys like that? I didn't think much of it. I mean, it was just it was just I don't know. Like, I didn't mind it, but I didn't have much thoughts about it. Did you read them? I, I heard them. 
right? At the beginning of the... <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. Um, for me, because I was reading them, I kind of just, like, glossed over it and kept reading. Mm-hmm. Because I kind of felt, like you said, that... I saw them as spoilers <laughs> more, say. like Sometimes they are, yeah. Yeah, like, I already was, like, the serpentine scene again, going back to that, like, the snippet at the beginning from Lady Whistledown was basically explaining what kind of happened. And I knew vaguely what happened because I remembered, I read it so long ago, but I still remembered. Um, so, yeah, I kind of just glossed over them. Um, and, yeah. I liked it. I thought it was a unique addition to the story, though. I really do is like Is that how it is in every that. book? Uh, yeah, I believe so. Yeah, even after you uh, know who Lady Whistledown is, it's still like that. I think so. Yeah, I think it just became a part of the series. Like just you know, because what's what's a Bridgerton book without the Lady yeah. Whistledown okay. stuff at the beginning? You know, but it's interesting. I heard um, Julia Quinn talk about like why she added that. Yeah, and the whole reason was that she needed a way to info dump. Without info dumping. That's actually a smart idea. Yeah, because she was like, I can't stand when characters are like, my name is Daphne Bridgerton and I have seven siblings. We are all named in alphabetical order. You know what I mean? Like, nothing's worse than that in a book. So she was like, how can I tell the readers what I need to tell them without having my characters just being so self-aware that they're like, here's my life yeah. <laughs> yeah no i actually do like that addition yeah and i think it works really well um the only place i don't like it because again spoilers it's like the the one chapter where the bee sting happens at the beginning it like literally tells you that a scandal is about to mm-hmm. happen yeah. and i'm like no don't tell me that <laughs> even though i've read it three times and i know it's coming <laughs> but also i think in instances i kind of find found it kind of I don't, I'm not making sense, but I found it kind of a nuisance when the story was not getting intense, but like it was getting more, I don't know, exciting, exciting. And you get cut off by. Yes. Yeah. I that's get exactly yeah. No, what I, I was trying I to say. I feel that way too. Yeah. All right. And then um, we should talk about a somewhat um, controversial scene, I guess. Some people don't see any issues with it some people hate it <laughs> what scene the office scene when oh. kate is hiding under the desk and antony comes in he's with sienna slash not sienna in this book <laughs> um, <laughs> yes and um they start talking obviously he doesn't know that kate is th- kate is there because kate had was in the hallway and she heard him coming and she so she hid and didn't yeah. know that this was his office and anyway um and then they have this whole thing where Antony um got himself a drink turns around sees Kate under the desk and he's like what the fuck (laughs) Kate is like in a little ball trying to hide um and then without telling Sienna like he approaches and Kate like (laughs) this girl was like hanging for dear life onto that man's leg (laughs) and bit his leg well, I mean, he says bit, but I'm pretty sure it was just her nails. No. She, surely she wasn't biting him. Um, you're forgetting. So his hand, his feet were on her hands, or one of her hands. So she didn't have her hands free. So she was biting so his was, leg. Yeah, she was biting his knee. Oh, no? That's right. Something like that around there. She was biting the fuck out of him, and then and then he, he kicks her, yeah. and then she she what does she do? She does she does something else. Anyway, she hits him somewhere, someplace. Again, they're being real violent with each other. (laughs) Anyways, the whole, like, controversy around that scene is that some people hate that Antony kicks her, but it's like, doesn't she do the same in return? I'm pretty sure she was gonna, like, draw blood from biting him as hard as she did. Right? Like, I just, why do people constantly just zoom in on the fact that he kicked her? I'm like, this bitch was biting the fuck out of him. And then she she kicked him or, or hit him right after. And it's a like, reflex. Like it was a reaction, no? Like, a, it's a reaction. Someone's biting you, so you Yeah, can't it's a out. reflex. Yeah. That's how I saw it. Like, to me, to me, it's they have that relationship where it's just like they give each other as good as mm-hmm. they get. Yeah. So... And I think we're also not People mentioning his, it was in his perspective and like the dialogue, yeah. his inner dialogue was saying like he felt no pleasure in hitting a woman. Yeah. 
Um, so I think we also need to recognize that. And, like, he just didn't do it to hurt her. He just, honestly, I think it was a reflex, yeah. like you said. S, like, that's I, it. it. It And, like, if you pay attention to the words that she's using, there's nothing that says he kicks her hard. It, it literally just says he kicks her. But when it's Kate, it's like she bites yeah. hard. She's, she, she kicks hard, yeah. whatever. Like, it's so there's definitely like a difference and to me i don't see why people scream abuse over that scene no. like i really don't get it I, to me it's just humorous of like them you know trying not get not to get caught and you know kate i just, just think that's a funny out. scene it is i really hope they keep it that's cause... one thing i hope they keep as well like where is this like uh like these comments like on goodreads like where people say that they hate this scene or what or like it's just comments uh, yeah or just in general when people are talking about this book but even even if you go on goodreads you'll find reviews where it's like one star abuse oh, <laughs> and then the people in the, the review are like oh he kicks her what the fuck yeah. like that's so yeah okay that's yeah. just i feel like being too sensitive i'm sorry I just, I don't know, if anything, I feel like people can find an issue with what happens afterwards, where he basically, he kisses her, yeah, but then he, like, you know, his emotions are kind of getting, you know, um, up the there, and him. he's starting to recognize. He's scared. Yeah, yeah, he's scared, and, like, that causes him to lash out verbally, which I guess, sa- it was, like, it was harsh what he said, and also the way that he kind of just threw the Throws key. Throws the key? Knowing yeah, that. That's more me. Yeah, he threw the key, knowing that she wouldn't be able to catch it knowing that she would she would see it as a humiliation um bending down to pick up the key that he fully knew that it was gonna end up on the ground i thought that was more quote-unquote abusive if you want to use that word um yeah then the kick to the well, stomach I mean, no but yeah it's not abuse maybe mentally emotionally yeah. i guess you could say but not if we're being nitpicky <sighs> but we're not they've like you said they kind of give as good as they get and She's also been really awful to him. And it's like, of course, we know internally he's struggling. Um, and he does apologize afterwards. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I just like, I think people are being too sensitive when it I, comes to I that. think the whole scene, like from the very beginning of that chapter, you see, he's already talking in his head about like how she's already made her way into his mind. And that scares him. And he's like, why can't I stop thinking about her? I don't like this, blah, blah, blah. And then she happens to be there, which is like, now she's like in- invading her I- his space, not just his, you know, thoughts. Mm-hmm. And they have that like verbal and physical sparring. And then, you know, they, ha- they get into this argument. And I think that by that point, he's just really scared. Yeah. And he's just really mad at himself because he's reacting to her in a way that he's never reacted to anyone else. In a way he never he wanted to react himself, he to wouldn't. someone. Yeah. And I mean, it's a man driven by his fear. Yeah. That's what he is. Like, that's what Anthony is at the at bottom line is like every time he's mean, it's because deep down he's scared. Mm-hmm. Not because he's actually mad at the person or no. he's mad that he's reacting to the person type of thing. And his trauma runs deep. And I feel like as readers and as like just people in general, we also need to recognize he was going through a lot and he was traumatized by a lot. And it wasn't just Kate that was going through things. And I feel like, I don't know, I just feel like as for Anthony, he puts on a strong front and we kind of take it as it is and we don't expect him to do things that are questionable or like to do things that, you know, um, portray his traumas. And I think in this case, I don't know where I was going with that, but he is traumatized. And I think as readers, we should recognize that he was going through a lot of things. And it wasn't just Kate that was going through her things as well. And I like what you said about like how he's he's written like a man of his time. Yeah. You know, for the most part. Like he has no need to apologize to her. He has no need to be, you know, kind to her. He you know, patriarchy was like going real well at that yeah. time. <laughs> like so <laughs> He, he had the world at his feet, so he had no, I don't know, like, I just, but because Kate, um, he slowly starts to change. Yeah. And you, you do see that in him, and I love that the next scene, I think it's the next scene anyway, um, it's the party, or the not the party, the, you know, gathering mm-hmm. type of thing at his um, Aubrey Hall. 
Yeah, country house. And the first thing he wants to do is apologize. Yeah, yeah. Which is a huge change for him. Like, to me anyway, it it marked, like, a, a growth for him because it was, like, right away he recognized... I did the wrong thing. I hate myself for what I did to yeah. her. She didn't deserve that. She deserves better. She deserves an apology. And so he does. And he he actually, because um, she's in a garden, because, you know, um, Lady Bridgerton is just as much of a matchmaker as um, Kate's mother, stepmother. Yeah. Um, so she's in the garden and he follows her and he apologizes. How, mm-hmm. What did you think of, of that scene? Because I think it's the start of a friendship between them. It was, huh? Like, I feel like that was a turning point for them. But I don't know. Up until then, like, I feel like I was still warming up to him, even though he was. Mm. But I think that's normal, though. Because, like, yeah. up, up until then, what ha- what has he done to make you love him? Nothing. Yeah. And Kate doesn't love him. Yeah. Kate, do- Kate, Kate doesn't like him at that yeah. point either. Yeah. So it's like, I don't necessarily think you're meant to like him at that point. No, I really enjoyed that scene. And I loved their scenes in the garden. I felt like they were... That was when they were their most real self. And, like, the first time, like you said, was, like, when he apologized and, like, they had that discussion. And I think that's when they labeled them as, like, friends. Like, they were friends to Mm -hmm. each other. And I really, like, I don't know. I just liked seeing that side of them. And I liked that scene. And, like you said, it was a turning point for Anthony, but also for Kate as well. Like, her, her shield kind of dropped for a second. And, like, of course, yes, he goes back to saying, like, oh, yeah, I'm going to go get Edwina and bring her to the field so we can play the game. Um, but, like, when they're just strictly just them two in the garden, it was very much raw and real and them. Yeah, it's like they, for the first time, allowed themselves to, to not protect themselves with, yes. like, mean comments and you know what I mean like because yeah. I do think for both of them it's kind of like a shield you know they use oh yeah they're very witty but they use their wit to shield themselves from people yeah and to keep a distance I think and I think that for that conversation is one of the first times where it's like they don't have that they're just being honest with each other and they're like you know what maybe maybe you're not that bad I don't like you but you're not that bad no. <laughs> And Colin mentions it, and he's like, you and Anthony to Kate, you guys are the same person. Like, you are so similar. Yeah. And it's so true. They are both elders. They both feel like they have to protect their, their siblings. And just their personality and, like, their own struggles, internal struggles, are quite similar. And, yeah, they are basically struggling the same struggle sometimes. Um, but, yeah, they were the same person. Following the garden scene is the <laughs> iconic Paul Mall scene. <laughs> In which um, Kate the chooses mallet the of mallet death, of death. <laughs> which is great. That's that's one scene I would love to see on the show. I, they better. Well, actually, Julia Quinn did say that like if she vetoes anything in the script, it's like, that. Like that better yeah. be in the script, or else she's like, nope. It scrap needs that. to be. Start over. It has to be. It's comic. Like it's perfect. It was written yeah. for TV. I feel yeah. like sadly, reggae <laughs> won't be in it to play Simon. Um. Maybe Benedict will join. Ooh, I would not be, be mad thing. with that. I would so be fine with another Bridgerton boy yeah. um, taking his spot in the Pal, Pal- Mall scene. Pal, Pal- Mall, yeah. Um, so I'd be fine. I think Bridgerton, the Bridgerton boys, um, they are very competitive. And I would love to see another oh. Bridgerton boy, yeah. you know, fight the fight <laughs> of the Pal Mall. I just, I love the moment where Kate is like, can I have a practice, like a practice, um, <laughs> yeah. not throw, but like a practice, what, what's it called? Hit. Hit. Yeah. Like a practice hit. And, and everyone turns to her and they're like, no. <laughs> and then Simon just looks over and he's like, um, okay. yeah. Because <laughs> he's never played it either. And like Kate and Simon kind of bonded here because they're like, we're both not Bridgertons. Like, we don't know what's going on. Why are they so hateful to each other? And like, why is the objective to get Anthony to lose? <laughs> <laughs> or or when uh, Anthony's ball hits the tree and then Kate's ball hits the same tree yeah. and falls right next to it and Daphne goes, oh, Lord. <laughs> and Kate is like, what? what? <laughs> What's going to happen? Daphne's like, you'll see. <laughs> and, but I love that they didn't really, they didn't like baby her. Like they didn't, they weren't easy on her since that was her first time. No. no they were like, bitch, this is, our, this, this is yeah. our game. This is our family game. We're violent if we have to be. Yeah. That's <laughs> I love it. Yeah. 
Yeah. Love it. And then it ends with uh, Kate throwing uh, Antony's ball into the lake. And (laughs) he loses. (laughs) And they're like, you know what, Kate, just for that shot, you're the winner. (laughs) I loved how um, Antony was like, because he saw her mind working. And he's like, you know, if you do this, you won't win. And she's like, I don't have a chance of winning anyway. And she goes, no. And she hits (laughs) her right into the lake. (laughs) And he was so angry. It was so funny. And they do have, like, again, like, a little bonding moment afterwards. Like, even though, like, that's where you see that, yeah, sure, he's competitive. He can get angry. But, like, at that point, even though he's angry that he lost because he's a sore loser, um, he's still, like, he's not being mean to her. No. Like, he's just being playful. And, like, afterwards, they're fine mm-hmm. with each other. And they have that little moment in the shed. Yeah. Um, anyways... <laughs> Which also kind of unrelated, but kind of related. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you noticed, but Daphne is pregnant in this book. Yeah. With the first baby. So I don't, again, that's like, I guess maybe they knew that something might happen with um, right, Daphne and Simon not being in season two as much yeah. because they had the baby at the end of season one. Um, so I guess Daphne wouldn't be pregnant here. I don't remember what the epilogue was for uh, the Duke and I. Was it the pregnancy? Uh, well, I mean, I think the epilogues always jump ahead. So right, I do yes, think it yes. was them having uh, having a baby, yeah. Okay. Or maybe having their second baby, actually. I don't know. Okay. Um. Anywho. And then they have that scene because, you know, thunder is coming. It's starting oh, to yeah. rain. Kate, Kate gets really anxious. <laughs> Antony doesn't know that she has a fear of, of thunder and lightning yeah. and stuff. And he finds and her under his table, under his desk. Oh, table. actually, before then, is is it before then that you, you have the scene where they're going to dinner and Penelope is yeah. getting like, that okay. was a nice scene, that was too. Before. Anyone wants to take it over? I feel like I'm talking a lot. Anyone wants to that talk about that That was a good scene? scene. That was a scene where I started with, like, okay, maybe he's not that bad. Where he... All right. Can you can you say it? What the so that was, was a scene where... What's her name? The mean girl. Uh, Cressida. Cressida was, you know... Bitch Cressida. Cressida. Yeah. She was talking shit about uh, Penelope and her dress, right? Her dress? Yeah. Um, her and her little group of friends were just talking shit. And then this other guy comes up and, like, looks at her up and down right he looks at her up and down like with yeah. disgust yeah another piece of shit. yeah and here comes anthony and i guess he overhears and he turns and he kind of like dogs all of them and escorts penelope inside so i really love that scene which is which goes against the custom mm-hmm. because he should be accompanying the highest ranking yeah. woman in the room but instead he goes in with penelope because yeah. He's she a was big boy. <laughs> and I love how um, Kate called him a hero. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's the last line of the chapter. She's like, he was a hero. <laughs> that was so cute. I love that. Because I do think it means a lot to Kate, who has always felt like she was second to everyone. Yes. You know, she doesn't have a whole lot of self-esteem. And I think that it was sort of important for her to see him act that way towards someone else who wasn't mm-hmm. her because i do think that that's like it makes a difference you know what i mean like it shows his true character like he's not oh, doing yeah. that for edwina he's not doing that for any reason other than he wanted to help penelope because he knew that was the right thing mm-hmm. and he he you know hates cressida as much as everyone yeah. else <laughs> so <laughs> just want i really want cressida to get into like a huge scandal I need that to happen. And then she has to marry, like, the nastiest... Burbrook. Like, I want her to marry Burbrook. <laughs> misogynistic piece of shit ever. And she's forced to marry that? Yeah, I need it. I don't understand why she doesn't marry that guy that's, like, just as ugly on the inside as she is. Like, how about you guys just go off and yeah. be mean to each other for the rest of your lives? What was his social standing? Like, what was his title? I don't know, because she's... I don't know. She's after princes now, I guess, mm-hmm. so... Maybe he's beneath her. I hate how she's probably going to be in season two. For sure. Yeah, uh, For sure. Oh. She's in all the books. Oh, God. <laughs> so, like, we're not rid of that woman. Um. Anyway, and that leads... Now it's the thunderstorm. Yeah, and that leads into the next scene, which is Kate. It's late at night. She can't sleep. The, it's raining outside. And so she goes to the library for a book, 
which is such a weird thing when you think about it. Have you guys ever thought about that? How people would just go into other people's libraries and like get a book? I would <laughs> never like, be. You able don't to do know. that nowadays. You don't touch my books. No. <laughs> No. Um, but while she's there, um, the lightning and thunder, you know, starts and she gets really scared and she hides under a table, which Kate does a lot of hiding under <laughs> under things in this book. <laughs> um, and Anthony walks by and he sees um, a candle that's lit and he's like, what the fuck? Someone left a candle in yeah. the library? Like, how dumb are you? Yeah. <laughs> which is so true. Again, like, I never thought about that. Um Anyways, and he finds Kate, you know, curled under a table, frightened, and he sits under the table with her. And as he comes and holds her, her hand, and he's like, "I'm here, I'm here, I'm with you, I'm here." I know he's adorable. Oh. It's a really sweet scene. I love that scene. Was that like another like another switch? For yeah, you? it was. It really was. So I was like, okay, he's not that bad. He's starting to change. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I really liked that scene, and I love how, like, we saw her trauma, and, like, not like that we saw it, but I like how it was dealt with, and I liked how, like, he wasn't making fun of her being afraid of the thunderstorms. Like, because he, he has his own fears. He has his own fears that can't be really like, explained or anything, and he just, he recognizes that, and he respects that, and he respects her, and helps her through it, and I loved that, and also what happens later on when they're married, he helps her through that again, and he's like, you know what, Kate, you need to go talk to your stepmom to find out what's going on, because this is more than just a fear, this is something happened, and then when we find out what happened, um, which basically hit her mom passed away during a violent thunderstorm, um, and that fear carried with her, like, she was only three years old, and that fear has carried, you know, she's carried it since, since then, she's 21 now, and yeah, it was just, like, it was a tough thing to read about and, like, you know, her experiencing her mom's death and witnessing how her mom died and it was a violent death. She ha- she was sick. Um, yeah, I just thought it was, like, it was well done. Her trauma and her fears were really well done, I think. Yeah, and I think the expectation is actually that when you go into that book that the most of the focus is going to be on Antony's trauma, which it is to a certain extent. But I, I do love that julia quinn sort of still gives both characters enough yeah of a story you know yeah. what i mean like it's not just Anthony's drama it's like no here's skate a fully developed you know character who has a story of her own and these two people are gonna bond over <laughs> their you know phobias together and it's it's cute i love that scene oh yeah and and i think it speaks volume that because she asks him to talk about his dad. And, like, that's the last thing he wants to do. Yeah. You know? And he does it. He actually does talk about his dad. And then she shares hers. And he's like, does it ever... Like, is it harder to lose a parent when you've known him or if you haven't? And she, she has this whole thing, which I really love. Like, the whole concept of even though she lost her mom when she was three, she was like, you do you do feel lost for those people even though you haven't known them yeah you know like i just i i don't know it was a it was an interesting concept for sure Mm -hmm. um and then oh okay the last thing i really kind of wanted to talk about in terms of like the plot was um i think it was after that point and like they've solidified their friendship bond um because obviously we know anthony won't let it go any further um, at that point, and she allows him to court Edwina, and, like, his, ch- like, his, the words that he's used, he's, like, my chest, like, hollowed out, like, it was just, he was taken aback, he was shocked that, like, what, like, she doesn't feel the same way, like, it was, like, I was, like, my angst, like, whew, like, it was just going up, because, like, yeah, it hurt him that she, like, he thought that she didn't feel the same way for him, but, like, at that point, we know that Kate, wanted anthony for herself but she obviously she thought that he would never want her what okay i kind of was a little bit peeved that like we kind of didn't see that continue like you know he is allowed to pursue edwina now i kind of wanted that to like i don't know maybe a chapter or two of that of like him half-heartedly trying to pursue her but also like maybe another gentleman at the party um, decided to take interest in Kate, and, like, I kind of wanted to see a bit of jealousy from Anthony's side, but their choice was taken away from them, and they had to get married. Maybe if, um, 
he didn't say anything like she said like oh you can you can pursue my sister now but then he does she just he just doesn't say anything but in his head he's like I don't think that that's what I want anymore type yeah. of thing and then she doesn't know that so then maybe they go their separate ways and like someone courts her and he gets jealous like I could see that but internally I don't think at that point no matter what he was gonna continue per- pursuing Edwina like I think he had sort of unconsciously decided that that's not what he was going to do. But he wasn't at that point, which is why I think obviously they were forced to get married, was he was never going to let himself pursue a relationship with Kate because of the feelings she evoked inside him. Like, he was never going to go choose Kate himself because he could love her. And he he knew that. Um, And that's why the whole scandal and, like, forced to marry happened with the whole bee sting in the garden because... No, there was no other way they would have gotten married, I think. Yeah, and, like, afterwards, he's like, but you know what? This kind of works in my favor. Yeah. I'm not that bad. Yeah. So, okay, so for me, that scene, are, are we already at the scene where the bee sting and all that? Yeah. The bee sting? Yeah. yeah so, I, think I yeah. like that scene. But the situation yeah. where they were forced, like, after they were caught and everything and they were forced into a marriage, I didn't like that. Because it kind of reminded me of the, I can't say the book, but the show. How they were caught and they were forced. So I kind of wanted. Well, I mean that's that's historical romance across yeah. the board. Yeah, like, it's usually. just how things. Yeah. Are. So I, I would <laughs> just... personally, I would have liked uh, for their friendship to develop differently and not forced. Personal preference, but I guess historical romance. It, yeah. It doesn't happen. Yeah. No, I I, I can see that. Um, I just I just love it because he's like. She's yeah. dying. <laughs> you I know, know what you said? Like, He's like, no, no, she's dying I right now. Even like, there's no at way. That scene though, because like I like, <laughs> he was so scared. It's so sad, but like, but it was a little it's funny. funny. Yeah, <laughs> no, it was funny. Okay, so this is how I, I kind of like, as you were talking about it, as I kind of saw this happening. Like, you know, the end of that chapter. You know, she decides to let him court Edwina, mm-hmm. and like they go their separate ways. Um, and then maybe some jealousy happens with another gentleman and then he kind of like in his head is like you know what I actually like I can't let Kate be with anyone else and like they don't he doesn't talk about it he doesn't vocalize his desires or his wants or whatever Um, and then the compromise happens like a bee stings her tit again not again but like it happens afterwards and then they get the whole scandal anywhere near her boobs but yeah yeah it was on her collarbone but like I kind of wish we had that because I like we know that Anthony desired Kate we knew that but I kind of wanted to see him jealous I don't know why I guess it's a trope I think he would have like hit out of the ballpark you know isn't there though like a scene where it literally says that he pushed someone out of the way in the ballroom to get to Kate well yeah but that was after they were he literally like manhandled someone to death (laughs) <laughs> that was after they were married. Yeah. Which, okay. Here's a question. How did you feel? Because I do feel that that's a little iffy. How do you feel about the fact that Kate was like, can we wait a week for the wedding night? And he was like, no, absolutely not. How did you feel about that? He was like, can you tell me one reason? Like one thing that you would do to prepare yourself during that week? And she was like, she couldn't tell. She couldn't say anything. So... But, it I mean, I feel like it was kind of normal for him to question because she wasn't giving an answer. Yeah, I mean, you would want to know. Yeah. I mean, he was like, I, you know, am allowed my husbandly rights. <laughs> okay, so that was after she failed to say why she needed it and yeah. also... No, it was before, I think. No, it Wasn't was. It? so what had happened was she's like, okay, I need a week. And then he's like, okay, can you tell me how you will prepare during this week? Like, I think he was contemplating, or maybe he was entertaining her. Um, and, like, she just didn't have an answer. And, like, I think at that point, like, obviously now you can't just be, like, or any, like, I mean, any gentleman would not ask you, wait, why do you need this week? And, like, what do you plan to do to prepare? Like, obviously that's not done. Like, but it's historical romance. And I don't know. Okay, so where I'm going with that is um, I think he realized that it was just, like, from her fear Nerves. and, like, her overthinking yeah. mind. That was causing her Which to do wouldn't this. help to wait, you know? Exactly. It would just, her fears would constantly, it would just build up higher and higher. And I think he knew that, which is why he's mm-hmm. like, no, I uh, I will not be denied my husbandly rights. And he knew that she expected that or, like, believed that that's how their marriage would go because that's how every marriage goes in that time is, like, 
the man gets the woman <laughs> like bodily you know but um, didn't he also didn't he also question like um he asked her like if something serious happened like if she was like raped or took in advantage of right yeah uh, he, he does get sort yeah. of worried that something might have happened to her that a man might have done something and he gets really like yeah. really scared <laughs> he's I know. like oh my god but no, nothing happened. She's just yeah. nervous. Yeah, so I was fine with the way it was handled. I mean, I'm fine with it, too, because I do think, like, at first you're like, ooh, Antonia, you're being a little rough here. Like, be, you know, understanding that she has nerves and stuff. Yeah. But then he kind of turns it around where it's like, okay, you, it makes sense. <laughs> um, but then it turns into their first time, which I just love. I think that their first time is really actually oh, sweet. I love their Kate, first time. Yeah, she's really insecure. And it's actually quite a long scene. Like, there's yeah. a lot of buildup before they actually do it because they talk. And, okay, they you know, talked a lot during explain stuff. She sees his dick. <laughs> he, she's like, oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> Which makes me, you know, feel a type of way that Anthony is hung. Yeah. Or she's never seen a dick before. <laughs> okay, fine. Shut <laughs> up, man. Do you is... have to kill it? I mean, I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Just stating facts. Anyways, but it's really, it's really sweet. Um, she, at, at one point, Anthony is like really enjoying himself. And he like, he like throws his head back and like has his eyes closed and stuff. So He's really into it. And uh, yeah, that moment. Mm -hmm. And uh, Kate is like, she stops. <laughs> she was like on the verge of climaxing. Because and he she says stops. you're so beautiful. Yeah. And, and he says that and, and she's like, who are you t thinking about? Are you yeah. picturing Edwina? Yeah. And it just breaks my yeah. heart. It broke my heart, too. It breaks my heart. And then he has that great monologue where he's like... Okay, I have no. it. I have it. I have it. <laughs> okay. okay, okay. So also one of my pet peeves with season one of Bridgerton is this, but we'll talk about they it after. They stole all of his lines. They stole his damn line. I was so pissed. And it's not it's not just I burn for you. I swear to God, when I reread it this time around, I there was another line, an iconic line from Simon that I was like, that was Antony. Do you know oh, why? Really? It's because they didn't have any memorable, notable lines because they're bland and Probably. boring. That's why. Okay. Do you know what Simon tells Daphne during their first time? My dick is hard. I'll be your blanket. <laughs> <laughs> In the book? Ew. Oh. So that's why they had to steal a couple of um, Anthony's lines. They couldn't lines make up, like, something else for... I'll be your blanket just wasn't going to work. Mm. Yeah, no. Anyways, so what does he say? <laughs> okay, okay, okay. So Anthony, in the midst of his arousal, you know, all yes. of that, he tells Kate after she's like, who are you picturing? He's like, listen to me, he, he said, his voice even and intense, and listen well because I'm only going to say this once. I desire you. I burn for you. I can't sleep at night for wanting you. Even when I didn't like you, I lusted for you. It's the most maddening, beguiling, damnable thing, but there it is. And if I hear one word, one more word of nonsense from your lips, I'm going to have to tie you to the bloody bed and have my way with you a hundred different ways until you finally get it through your silly skull that you are, you are the most beautiful and desirable woman in England. And if everyone else doesn't see that, then they are all bloody fools. Why would they do that? Why would they take that I burn for you line for... Yeah, I know. Because that's I mean, like I said, because Simon was not skilled mm. in that department. I mean, they made it work. I'm sure they'll, they'll give him something else. Yeah, but I kind of want all of... Like, this whole monologue needs to be in it. But I feel like they gave Simon his a different monologue that kind of worked for him. Because he didn't have any, like, mm. sort of declaration no, like it that. worked. It worked for Daphne and Simon with what they went with in the in the yeah. show i mean i just i really really hope that they keep um i was gonna say simone's <laughs> that they keep kate's um you know insecurities yeah it's because it's like, a big part in their relationship yeah and i i i think that that's like a, a a cool way of representing it of like her seeing this man that's like really you know having pleasure and like enjoying the act and thinking like that couldn't, like, I couldn't be the reason why he's feeling that way, right? Plus, like, it has to be said that her, her stepmom told her that a man can get his pleasure pretty much anywhere before. So she was like, clearly it's not me. It couldn't be. Okay, but can I just say, I, I really respected Mary in the sense where she actually gave Kate a talk. She gave her the sex talk. 
Whereas poor Daphne did not get that from her own mother. And I really want Mary and Kate's sex talk to be included in the show just to show the difference between Violet yeah, and Daphne's. Yes. And, like, how Agreed. it isn't the same for every woman of the time. Because I feel like that was very much, da- like, Daphne's story of not being educated enough in, you know, the m- sexual marriage bed, whatever. Um, and, like, it wasn't the case for Kate because she had her own struggles. And I kind of, yeah, I just, I want it. I want Mary and Kate. But also story. how much of a, like, it's an important responsibility. And, and like you said, it'd be interesting to show how, well, one mother doesn't do it and looks look what happens yeah. how dangerous that can be to keep people ignorant that way and then look at kate who does get the talk and has a very healthy sexual relationship yeah. with her husband yeah like it's possible but it's important for them to not be kept ignorant yeah because mary said she had wished her own mother had given her the talk the first time she got married because she said it was like she didn't go into detail but you can tell it was not a good experience and i really like that she took her own experience and her own history and like decided to educate her daughters on what she should have been educated on. And then, um, let me see. Oh, yeah. So following this, um, you know, a couple of stuff happens. And then you have that scene that you were talking about where um, Kate has another nightmare where essentially she's, you know, goes back to being like three and calls out to her mom. Yeah. And Anthony is like, what the hell? She sounds so young, blah, blah, blah. And then the next morning he's like, you should probably ask your stepmom about this. Um, Because I do think there's more to it, and she does, and um, she kind of feels afterwards like she's found a missing piece of herself, and she she's like, I I feel really optimistic. I feel like next time that there's a storm, I'll you know have a better understanding of why I feel the way I Mm -hmm. feel, and etc. And and she feels like it's a you know it's a new day for her essentially, and you have that moment for Antony where he's sort of jealous no he's jealous Um, he says he's jealous he he (laughs) is but i actually like that moment for him because i do think it's very human yeah of of course like yeah you see someone who has similar issues as you and you see that they are able to move past it and you're like why can't i you Mm -hmm. know and i I think it's very normal to get frustrated yeah um and and to be like i want that but at the same time, at that point in the story, he's not doing his own um, soul searching in order to get there. No. You know, like he's kind of just frustrated like, because she got over it and I can't. Yeah. You know? And it wasn't easy for Kate. We knew that. No. He knows that. It wasn't no. easy. But it's just like him wanting to be over his own trauma and his own, you know, fears and not being able to is like it's really rubbing him the wrong way and it like it's sad i felt so bad for him during that scene and then he has that whole moment where i don't even remember what they're talking about but he you know gets mad mostly at himself yeah. and then he leaves and he's like i'll see you when i'll see you well i think it was more because she okay what had happened was they had some kick-ass amazing sex And then um, they're cuddling in bed, and he's like, shit, I'm so happy. And then she's like, I want this always and forever. And, like, those words are triggering for him because he doesn't think he will have forever with her. He doesn't think he'll have an always with her. And, like, he literally runs out of the room like he's seen a ghost. And, like, it's just, like, all of his fears are just bombarding him again. And, like, his traumas are just, like, there. And he's he's realized he's in love with her at that point. Yeah. Like, he he says so. And he's... But he hasn't confessed no, he, it? No, he hasn't told her, but he, he, he in his head, he's like, I'm in love with her, actually. Um, yeah. So I think it's, like, all a little bit too much for him yeah. in that moment. And he runs away because he's, like, forever is, like, eight to nine years for me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Which <laughs> I do think that some people could think of this as, like, a ridiculous fear. But I I completely disagree. Um I actually, like, have something similar. Well, I mean, I've had something similar in the past where um, something happened to me. And because of that, I had a phobia of dying. Like, I was, every night when I went to bed, it was completely unrelated to what had happened. But it just, it's how it manifested in me, I guess. Mm -hmm. Um, But every night, I was convinced that I was going to die. My gosh. Because I was having panic attacks. And if you have panic attacks yeah. and you don't know what panic attacks are, you think you're dying. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, and I just so relate to him in the sense that, like, I had that conviction 
in me. And yet I, I wasn't using my time to like tell my family I loved them or tell my family about what was going on or anything. It was like, I don't know. Like, I don't know how to explain it, but I just, I get him on that front. I I just, I don't think it's a ridiculous or, and, and I do think there's like an author note at the end where Julia Quinn sort of explains the bond between father and son and how this actually is a thing. No, it is. No, I was going to say, um, so past Sephra, past bitchy Sephra, we don't know her. Um, (laughs) we love her though. (laughs) I remember thinking his fear was stupid and I was like, and reading the second time around, I was like, man, Sephra, how did you not read the book? Like, what were you reading? Um, and like, I, my heart went out for Anthony because like, it's such a common fear and like, you know, knock on wood, I am so grateful that I have both my parents and they're both alive and they're both healthy. Um, but just the idea of like my parents dying and like leaving me, like it's a real fear, like it's scary. And like, imagine having one of your parents dying at a young age and like, I don't know. I just feel like it's stupid that people, society doesn't understand yet. Yeah. Yeah. You would be like, what the hell? It's scary. You just dropped dead. Yeah. And it's like, sure. Yeah. The way he died, you know, it was, it was sad, but like just the idea of like a child having, he was 18 when his dad died, just the idea of like his, like his dad dying at such a young age. And Kate even mentions it. Like you need your father the most at that point, you know, you're growing into a man, like you are becoming an adult and you don't have your, your role model, your, your model of what a man should be. You don't have that. And it's just like, it's so scary. And like that fear is such a real fear for a lot of people um, that lose their parents really young and I really liked that this book dealt with it. And I felt like it was such a real fear for people to have. Especially in that time period. Because nowadays it's like, yeah, sure, boys are close to their dads, whatever. But not necessarily nowadays. No. You know what I mean? Like, we don't, we're not, like, we don't think of our parents as like, here's what a man should be or mm-hmm. here's what a woman mm-hmm. should be. But back then, the boys were thrust upon their fathers, like, teach them how to be. Yeah. And the, the the girls were with their mothers. Yeah. And so in that case, Edmund and Violet ne- were never that way. No. Like it specifically says in the prologue that like Edmund was all about his kids and he didn't care. He wasn't like, you know, he didn't treat the girls differently. But I still think that it's like for Antony, it was like his whole world was his father. Yeah. And he thought of him. He was putting him on a pedestal because Edmund was a great man. And he was like, I'll never achieve anything that this man has achieved because I'll never be good enough. I'll never be good as good or better. Was, wasn't there a scene in, in the show where it's Anthony and um, Simon, they're at that little club drinking and they're both have, they'll both have issues. And Simon says something that triggers him, something about his dad, right? Or uh, he says something like, do you think your father looks down on you and is proud of what you've done? Yeah. And then Tony loses it. So I'm thinking back yeah. to like the show and then how he's dealing with his fear and with his um, struggle and, you know. So it's- yeah, because like Simon and him did have such different childhood and different like upbringings. And yeah, I mean, like Anthony wasn't really being a stand up man. And book one or, like, I guess season one. Um, so, yeah. I mean, like, I'm, I kind of want to go back and watch his scenes from season one. Just Anthony's scenes. Um, and just, like, watch him. <laughs> <laughs> just watch him? Yeah. Just watch him. <laughs> just, you know. Uh, but, yeah, it definitely shows, like, two portrayals of fatherhood. Yeah. And how wrong it can go or how great it can go. But it can still end terribly because of how great it was you know what I mean like it's just I think it's interesting like Antony and 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 Simon are kind of foils in that sense like they both became similar but for completely different reasons um but they're all they're both gonna be great dads because yeah you know yeah and I think so like this kind of goes for me like into like the monster of the story which I don't know if we're getting into yet uh sure no but we kind of already talked about it how like we like Anthony let his grief and his past shaped his whole life. Like, he shaped oh, his life 100%. around the idea of his death occurring at 38 or younger um, and never living up to his father. And that made him not want to fall in love and not actually have a substantial relationship with anyone else. And, like, 
it caused him to not live his life to the fullest until he realized, you know what, I need to live every moment like it's my last. And Kate even tells him, like, you got to live every moment and just live in the moment and accept that life could end at any point. Like, you could die tomorrow. I could die tomorrow. And, like, she kind of almost does when, like, the carriage falls on her and, like, loved yeah. that scene, by the way. And it's just, like, he has to. <laughs> wait, wait. What? When she's stuck under the carriage and she's just like cursing up a storm and Anthony is like howling at the moon like it was supposed to be me. Yeah. <laughs> and Kate is just, can you just get me out? Yeah. <laughs> I just love her sass. Yeah, no, I love it. And then she it. sees her and... leg and she's like, oh my God. <laughs> it didn't hurt until I saw it. She kind of broke her foot. I mean, her leg and I felt so bad. Yeah. But that scene also needs to be in it. Like, that intensity oh, needs to I, be. It will be. I really think it will be. Because, yeah. like, drama. Yeah, we need drama. It, we love you know? it. Um, yeah. But, yeah. Um, so, yeah. Just, like, living life to your fullest. And I love that he did eventually overcome his monster. But, like, it was something he needed to do himself. And he did recognize that it's something he needed to do himself. He needed to live up to the age of 38 and surpass that as well. And... That's the only way he would put that behind him. I actually don't think he fully overcame it in the sense that in the epilogue, which I love the epilogue just because um, essentially it takes place on the ninth, uh, the nine, uh, well, the night of his 39th birthday. Yeah. That was a mouthful. Yeah. Um, and I just love it because essentially, well, First off, the book finishes and, and Kate is like, you don't have to get past it. Because he's like, I don't know how to get past it. Yeah. And she's like, you don't have to get past no. it. You just have to not let it control your life. Exactly. Which is what he had been doing. You know, like you don't really get over phobia. No. If you do, great. But if you don't, you just have to learn to live with it without it becoming your whole life. Yeah. Um, so I do love that he was like, okay. And then they lived nine years where you, it, it was probably a, a, a fear of his once in a while. Oh, but yeah. he'd never let it over, you know, overtake his whole life. Mm -hmm. And then on the ninth of the night of his 39th birthday, why is that such a mouthful? I don't understand. They have this really beautiful moment. I just love how they're waiting in silence yeah. for the clock yeah. to turn midnight. And then he decides to ring in his birthday with some birthday six. <laughs> well yes he does but i just love how sweet that is like yeah. it's just yeah, it's no. it's silent they're just together waiting for it and it's like for him it's like a he can take a breath yeah no and like um like we've talked about anthony respecting her fears and traumas and not belittling them and i think kate also did such a good job of not just a good job but she was like she accepted his fears and she recognized them and also respected them and she knew that yeah, some people might think these are ridiculous fears to have, but you know what? I'm standing by you. Like, it's your own fear. It's valid. It's recognized. And, like, yeah, I stand by you, and I'm going to sit here in silence until, you know, your birthday comes to pass. Um, so, yeah. I, lo I love their relationship, okay? I just thought they were really well done. I agree. What about you, Wes? Yeah, I agree. But I will say for Kate, I feel like her monster was, at least how I saw it, she kept putting herself down. And like, you know, belitt belittling herself and kind of, she just, it seemed like she felt like she wasn't as great as her sister. And I really hated that And it's that sad. Yeah. For me, I kind of said society was her monster because they're the ones that put that mindset into her head. You know, yeah. she somehow felt lesser than Edwina because they kept saying that she wasn't beautiful or because like she was always the one that like got looked at second. And like society was kind of the one that put that on her. But then Kate also internalized it, like you said, and, like, it caused her to doubt herself a lot and doubt her relationship with Anthony a lot. Uh, yeah, I just have a quote. Um, it's Kate, and she says, She was acting foolishly, a prison of her own insecurities, insecurities she hadn't even known she possessed until she'd met Anthony. All her, all her life, she'd been the one who'd received the second glance, the second greeting, the second kiss on the hand. As the elder daughter, it should have been her due to be addressed before her younger sister, but Edwina's beauty was so stunning that uh, uh, the pure and perfect blue of her eyes so startling uh, that people simply forgot themselves in her presence. And it's like, forgot that Kate was there to begin with. That's so sad. Uh, yeah. And, and 
I just, I mean, obviously, I was going to say, like, I just love that Anton, he was like, you're the most beautiful, but, like, romance hero, you know? Yeah, <laughs> like, but I don't, I think like th- is that surprising? <laughs> I think this book was realistic in the sense where, like, um, Anthony kind of remarked upon Kate not being as beautiful at the beginning when they first he met. Did. He said that she was, quote, too much of this or too much of that or too much of that. And, like, I kind of liked that in the sense where, like, Kate, she wasn't conventionally beautiful. And I think we should accept that, but she was beautiful in her own way. And, like, Anthony, as he fell in love with her, recognized her beauty and, like, grew to, like, see her as the most beautiful woman which she was like she honestly her personality was just beautiful i loved kate but but yeah that's like so realistic because i mean i don't know about you guys but like it's happened to me where i was like oh i don't like this guy's not that hot and then you know fast forward a year and i see him again and i'm like wait a minute (laughs) why are you so hot though (laughs) you know what i mean like it happens sometimes you're like eh and then you're like wait a minute yeah so, you know, real- realistic in that way. Yeah. Um, another thing, because you said, like, society is a monster. Um, a small thing that I wanted to address was the fact that... Um, so after they announced their wedding, but before the wedding, uh, there's, like, a week. And um, I just hate, hate that Anthony can just go on and live his life, Ugh. but... Kate is receiving yeah. like insults. People are talking behind her back. People are coming to call on her and like saying really mean things. Like Ugh, they were awful. How did you? How did you manage it? Blah blah blah. Like and it just goes to show how like the man can just do whatever and all of it falls onto the woman yeah. in this case. And like she's the one that has to. Plus, like it's even more hurtful for her because she already has all those insecurities. Like she doesn't need to be told like. How did you manage a man like that when you look like that? You know, know what I mean? Like, it's awful, and I hated every single second of it. But wasn't there like a, a scene too where she was just kind of like, like whatever about it? Like later on, where I think, I think it was her and Adina. I think for her, she kind of has to be whatever about it because they're so toxic and because they constantly come for her throat, and like she, like it's never not mentioned that she's not as beautiful as Edwina and I think it's because yes it's in her head it's in her perspective but I also feel like other people go out of their way to tell her that or like go out of their way to portray that she isn't as beautiful as her sister so I think as a person you kind of have to desensitize yourself from it and like it still bugs her which is why she mentions it but you kind of just not need to let it slide off your back yeah and and another small thing was um another quote but this one is about uh her fear of storms and her sort of uh diving into that she says she wanted to understand why she was so afraid of the storms but prying into one's deepest fears was almost as terrifying as the fear itself what if she discovered something she didn't want to know and I just think that that applies to literally every book we read. Like, it's just there, like, every character, when we talk about the monster, like, most of the time they have to have that courage to overcome said thing or, like, yeah. look inward and, and realize that this is an issue that they need to change. Um, because, yeah, like, what if you find something that, you know, is scarier? And I, I think that that's the fear most of the time. It's like, can I live with it? Yeah. Maybe not. So I'm. I better just stay as I am, even though I'm, you know, unhappy. Do you mean like in the sense of like investigating more, like, um, and then finding something that that you don't like? So, yeah. Okay. That that's for me. That's a big fear of mine personally, of yeah. knowing that there's something there. Yeah. I mean, and it's totally normal. Yeah. So. So 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 I like that because it's like, yeah, maybe you don't want to investigate your fear because like you know. Yeah. Yeah what if and and in her case it it was like a traumatic um memory but it turned out fine because for her and this is kind of also like the moral of the story it's like at the end of the day yes it was a traumatic memory but she's happy she knows because now she can actually identify why she has that fear Mm -hmm. which the not knowing doesn't make it any better in the end all right, uh, this is where we're going to end this episode of Romancing the Monsters on The Viscount Who Loved Me by Julie Quinn. 
Um, I hope you enjoyed the episode. If you want to know what we're reading next week, you can find us on social media. Um, on Instagram, we are Romance and the Monsters Podcast. On TikTok, we are Romance and the Monsters Pod. And on Twitter, we are Romance... No, we are the RTM Pod. <laughs> Um, and then you can also find me on both Twitter and Instagram at Foes and Lovers. And you can find me us on both Instagram and Twitter at But This Book. And you can find me, Seth, on both Instagram and Twitter at Pillows of Wolves. So if you liked this episode, um, please feel free to live. <laughs> yes, please feel free to do exactly that. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> What that translates to is, um, (laughs) please feel free to leave us a like, a review, or just any comments that you have about this episode, or any episodes in the past as well. We just want to hear from you. They just mean a lot to us, so that's what that translated to. I just I just love that you slipped into your alien language for a minute. (laughs) Well, I've been practicing for my alien husband. On Duolingo? On Duolingo? You've you've been practicing your alien? Yeah, you really added an alien language, right? And I'm You're kidding. I know. I mean, I know. I would know. We've all been practicing stuff. Yeah. (laughs) Anyway, we haven't said bye yet, so bye. Bye. (laughs) Bye. See ya. (laughs)